Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Johnson, CEO of BioForward. From myself, the BioForward team, and the board of directors, welcome to the 2023 Wisconsin BioHealth Summit. Got to change my slide. Oh, 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 nope, too fast. I'm going back. Does it go back? Can you go back? <laughs> Wasn't sure if that was an automatic or not, so I'll start though. So in 1989, I was able to join some amazing individuals in starting a company, Novagen. Kareem Featherstone, now on the BioForward team, was one of those individuals. We went through a lot. There were several times you wondered if we were gonna make it, but we did and the company flourished. And it was purchased in 1998 by Merck KGAA, Later investments by them is a familiar company here in Madison, Verona, uh, Millipore Sigma. But as I look back at my experience and many others, the greatest gratif gratification I have had is at least I tried. Sometimes we fail, it's not the right move, but I don't like looking back and knowing I overanalyzed the situation rather than just forging ahead and putting myself out of my comfort zone. Those moments strengthen us, and they guide us to future success. Since I like to take great liberties with songs, I thought both the Bob Dylan song and this quote also related to our biohealth companies and research institutions. All of those news headlines, the pictures of individuals who are your valuable employees, the video demonstrating our strength in personalized medicine, you are changing Wisconsin you're not holding back. You're taking action, growing your companies, and you're innovating within our research institutions and academic institutions. You're helping to lead the state, this nation, in personalized medicine, and that is our theme around this summit this year and also the focus of our EDA Tech Hub application. We're still waiting for a decision on whether we will receive a designation and or strategy grant, but at least we came together. We took a chance on going after this designation. It was a team effort from BioForward to our biohealth companies, our precision and automation manufacturers, economic and workforce development entities, our state, research and academic institutions. We will be disappointed, especially Lisa, if we are not awarded this designation, but at least we don't have regrets. We tried. No matter what the EDA's decision, our Wisconsin biohealth industry is strong and growing. Our video was produced to demonstrate that power and to have pride in what is as being accomplished in Wisconsin. And to showcase that power, we have a great leadoff session of presentation and panel discussion on innovations in personalized medicine. Morning sessions then occur at 11 o'clock after some networking time that focuses on the diversity and strength of our manufacturing ecosystem, Wisconsin's valuable supply chain coming into our industry. Then a great session on preventive care and health equities and then our third annual student communications competition. We then follow up with lunch and our ninth annual awards presentation, honoring two impressive individuals, Chris Meskel, <coughs> excuse me, and Tom Grest. We then go to our 130 sessions, which once again, a focus on manufacturing but now our strength in biomanufacturing. In Promenade, our popular emerging growth companies' presentations and discussions. Then, after our networking session, we have a great ending presentation by Accuray to wrap up our focus on personalized medicine. So some of those cool images you saw in that video, that was Accuray. So we thank all of our sponsors for supporting BioForward. We cannot create this event each year without you. Where is it important for a summit like this to come together, to network, be connected to one another, to be educated, take pride 
and one another's accomplishments. From networking to the student registrations, swag, receptions, the keynotes, panels, we thank all of you sponsors. And BioForward could not, would not exist without you, our members. All of you are important, and we appreciate our medallion members that provide the additional support for us to invest in so many different initiatives, including the summit. I'm just going to wait a minute until they all go through. OK, now I got to get away from the podium, because we know Lisa has to have a story. Um, no bike accident this year. Um, obviously, it's about an owl. So um, most nights, after my husband and I eat dinner, uh, we like to take a walk. You know, it's good for the digestive system. So we go out, and it's starting to get dark, you know, a few weeks ago. And, and, and you're going to have to excuse me. I'm not going to get this right, but I don't want to blow your eardrums. We hear this. This crying out, right? This screeching, yelling. And I'm like, oh my God, what is that? And so I have my iPhone, I get out my bird sound app, and it's, it's a great horned owl. And I'm like, oh my God, isn't that the coolest thing? A great horned owl. And now just so you know, great horned owls can be like everywhere, all over the United States. But this owl, chose Wisconsin. In this case, it was Stoughton, Wisconsin. So every night we you know, keep going out, we still hear this ah, screaming, you know, just yeah. I mean, it's loud, folks. I'm not doing it justice, but I don't want to blow you out. And so one night we're going, and I'm like, OK, I think it's up in this tree, this big maple, right? So my husband has his headlamp on, and he flashes it up there. And sure enough, there's the great horn owl sitting on the very top of the tree. That branch does not do it justice. This guy's way up there, right? Every owl in Dane County had to hear this owl. He was yelling like crazy. So I'm like, God, oh, this is so neat that we have a great horn owl in our neighborhood. Not so much. So that night, six hours later, I'm sound asleep. Lisa needs her sleep. And this screeching, ah! You know, yelling, that ding owl came to the tree right outside our bedroom window. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This does not work. So we have one of these gigantic lamps. We live on Lake Higanza. And so I go out there and I'm flashing it at the tree. And great, owls do not like that bright of light. So he flies down the lake. And I'm like, oh, awesome, that's good. I can hear him in the distance, but okay, I can get back to sleep. So, no, next night, two in the morning, wakes me up again. And I said, you know what? This is, not, this is getting irritating now. So I did it again, did it again, kept flashing, and then he went away. So it's been about 10 days now, and I haven't heard Great Horn Owl. But you know why? Because I think he found what he was looking for. This place, Wisconsin. I think there's a whole pack of owls they don't need to be screeching anymore because they are where they are supposed to be, and it's here. So I hope you guys all feel the same way. I mean, you're, you're here, your companies are here. For those that are working at the company, I mean, this is, Wisconsin is a great place to be. And especially this industry, our research institutions, our university systems, this is where it's at. But we got to keep screeching. Did my owls leave? What happened to my owls? So anyway. Uh, I feel like, am I supposed to go off stage? But I'm going to keep going. Um, this is where it's supposed to be, right? So we got to keep screeching and yelling. And, you know, I say it every year. we got to be loud. But it's, it's BioFord's trying. We're investing. We're marketing. We're trying to be loud. We want that talent here. We want the companies here. But we also need you doing the same thing. we got to keep bringing people in here and more and more companies and partnering. So. Let's all try and do that. And to the students that are out there, I hope you stay here. I hope you're with this industry. But you know what? If you have to fly away for a while, that's OK, too. That's good. But then fly on back, right? Come back in like that great horn owl. 
we want you here, we need you here, um, I need that next generation after me, I'm almost done, Let, I need you. So anyway, I thank all of you, and again, the sessions coming up today show how strong this industry is, the assets that we have here all across the state. This isn't just about Madison, this isn't just about Milwaukee, this is statewide. So we're trying to do that, prove to that it's about all of us. And so I'm really excited about the show today. And with that, I am gonna introduce Chad Eschler of Findor, our sponsor for this opening keynote, and then he will introduce our opening keynote presenters and presenters. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everyone. On behalf of Findorf Construction, welcome to this year's BioHealth Summit. Again, my name is Chad Eschler, I'm Vice President of Business Development at Findorf, and I'm honored here to represent the 1,300 men and women that I get to work with every day. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to say uh, some opening remarks. It was the first BioForward event post-COVID, and here I am today thinking about this new virus. Have any of you heard about the peekaboo virus? No one? Well, the, the good part is they figured out how to treat it. It's at the ICU. <laughs> All right, so, so Lisa, Lisa likes her music. I love my dad jokes, so please stop by today, share, share some jokes with me. Um, but Findorf has been honored to work with a lot of you here today. Uh, the facilities we build, along with the activities that all of you do inside them, are changing lives. Building and Beyond is our slogan because the work we get to do has a much farther impact than just another building. These buildings are saving lives, educating our future leaders, and creating the next big thing. We are so lucky to be working in this community where academics, healthcare, and private businesses are creating our first discussion today, focused on innovations in personalized medicine. I would like to welcome to the stage UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, RPRD Diagnostics, and Danaher to the stage. Thank you. such a great event. I'm really looking forward to this day. Uh, my name is John Audia. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Basic Research, Biotechnology, and Graduate Studies in the School of Medicine and Public Health. And as a professor, I thought we'd start off by level setting the entire room and talking a little bit about what personalized health and personalized medicine is really all about. There we go. So personalized health. This is actually a quite an old term. It's been tossed around for a long period of time. It's been transformed in some ways by the Obama administration, which really raised up the idea of precision health. But I'd like to return to personalized health because that's now a capability that's within our reach. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what I mean by that. So first, personalized health really focuses on what makes us all unique from your molecular data and your health information all the way to your family history, your social circumstances, the environments in which you grow up. All of these things impact your longevity and uh, your mortality. And ultimately, our goal is really to integrate the unique personalized data into, uh, into health research and clinical care to reduce the uncertainty and improve prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment of disease. This is an incredibly lofty goal. It's been before us for the last thousand years. Uh, and, but we're finally at a point in history where we actually have the technologies to realize this, this really amazing dream. The anticipated result is really better health and better well-being for everyone. 
The big question is how we get there. And how we get there is through personalized medicine. And I'm going to frame this out as a paradigm shift. We're really thinking about this quite differently because over the last several decades, we've seen technologies emerge that are absolutely amazing. But it's really the integration of these different approaches that will allow us to really achieve personalized medicine. One of those approaches is genomic. And genomic approaches involve sequencing. And there's a lot of fear out there about DNA sequencing and who holds your information secure. But we're solving those problems. Our data health industry is absolutely phenomenal here in the state of Wisconsin. And I want to highlight one center at the UW, the Center for Human Genomics and Precision Medicine, which is making leaps and bounds in the area of genomic approaches and genomic medicine. We now have a new service line enabling rapid sequencing and an understanding of the molecular basis of disease in patients in diseases ranging from cancer to neurodegeneration to diabetes. This type of transition in terms of leveraging genomic information is revolutionary. And it's even more so when we integrate it with imaging approaches, which again, is another area of immense importance and excitement right now in the field. In particular, quantitative biomedical imaging can now leverage artificial intelligence software, as well as machine learning, to achieve something that we never thought feasible before, and that's an imaging biomarker. So a radiological image of a tumor, for example, two decades ago could tell you yes or no, whether you had cancer or not. Now with advanced techniques and technologies, we're able to transform that simple image into something that is going to enable us to start treating that tumor immediately, because we know what stage that tumor is, or we know uh, the margins of that tumor to such a high precision that we can enable very, very specific uh, approaches to obliterate that particular tumor. If we further then combine that with fluid biomarkers, circulating DNA, uh, other fluid markers from the CSF, we can now diagnose disease at a very early stage. And this is what's absolutely critical about personalized medicine. We need to have a, t a period of time to intervene in the disease course. And the earlier we're able to actually intervene, the better the outcomes are going to be. One of the key new approaches that we're really leveraging now is Theranostics, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this. It's using the same imaging technology for both diagnosis and treatment. And very recently, we've set up a new institute on our campus, which is embedded within our world-renowned UW Carbone Cancer Center. That Institute for Theranostics and Particle Therapy uh, has huge investments behind it just in the last year. WARF, uh, which is a major supporter of the UW system, has uh, generously provided us seed funding in the order of $1.5 million to start building out our Theranostics Institute. We additionally have an, uh, an $8 million NIH grant that just came in within the last several weeks. This is going to allow us to construct a new facility which is going to house the instrumentation to enable us to generate the next generation of radiopharmaceuticals for both diagnosis and for treatment. Ultimately, our institute has a number of goals, developing superior cancer-targeted molecular imaging and radiotherapy uh, agents, as well as more effective radioisotopes, developing the image-based radiation dosimetry procedures for <coughs> optimizing patient selection. We can now drill down and come up with a very specific approach for treating any individual with, with any type of solid tumor. We want to translate these preclinical discoveries we're making in the laboratory ultimately to clinical practice. And this is where UW Health has been an absolutely amazing partner. Their new construction part, uh, project on the east side, the East Park Clinic, that will be opening its doors in the, in the coming months, uh, will be an exciting place for treatment of our cancer patients, where I anticipate they'll be coming from miles and miles around to see the most advanced technologies being put to task. And that includes a series of Theranostic suites to, develop the th uh, to deliver the therapies that will enable us to intervene in, in disease course. 
This is all done in parallel with a wonderful training atmosphere at UW-Madison, really focused on graduate education and postdoctoral work, focused again on theranostics, but also other uh, medical approaches. This is really critical, ultimately, to establish the workforce that is going to be uh, transformational for our state. This all sort of falls together in, in this diagram, which a colleague of mine, Dr. Scott Reeder, helped to put together, uh, where precision health is really at the centerpiece, integrating biological diagnostics, imaging uh, technologies, personalized therapies, community-supported uh, technologies, as well as biohealth technologies, and the electronic record. Having all of this then further supported by entrepreneurship, research and development, uh, and the in industry of this fantastic state, I think we have uh, the opportunity to do something absolutely transformational. This is further supported by incredible facilities, incredible education and training, not only here at UW-Madison, but across the entire state, including uh, the Milwaukee College of Wisconsin, another uh, absolutely fantastic institution. The manufacturing base, the supply chains, all with a community benefit plan. And you'll hear a little bit about that in, in the health equity discussion that's upcoming. Finally, I think this is in all of your programs, at least a version of this diagram, but it really brings together all of the various, or many of the various industries uh, across the entire state which can work together to just make us a leader in supporting the biohealth uh, economy throughout the entire nation. And I'm just so excited about what we're gonna be doing and talking about today. We have some uh, wonderful uh, keynote talks coming up here. So I will first introduce Uli Brucker, the founder and CEO of RPRD Diagnostics. Thanks. <clears throat> Great, thank you so, so much for the um, nice introduction and the uh, invitation to talk today. And I want to thank BioForward for giving me the opportunity to present um, on our company, RPID Diagnostics. So we are a, a clinical pharmacogenetic um, implementation and testing and precision medicine company. We're based in Milwaukee. We're a spin out from the medical culture of Wisconsin. And uh, we really leverage our experience uh, for over 15 years of implementing pharmacogenetic testing, one aspect, one component of um, precision medicine. So if we're thinking about pharmacogenetics and precision medicine, um, many of you, you might have received some drugs, and although quite a few pharmaceutical companies probably want to make you believe that their drug always works for everybody and um, cures all the disease, that is actually not the reality. The, the response to treatment um, is variable. And uh, genetic factors, among other factors, uh, really influence how well a drug works, if side effects occur, what type of side effect occurs, um, what the best dose will be uh, to achieve the best results, and how a drug interacts with other medications. So genetics really influences that. And uh, for many diseases, the drugs from various drug classes are also available, so you have a quite spectrum. And um, obviously, it's beneficial to pick the most, um, the, the best drug to treat a patient to reduce the, the side effect profile and um, reduce the, the guesswork what we as physicians sometimes uh, have to do. So we're thinking about, so what, what's the, the market size? How, you know, how prevalent is this really? There are very different ways how you can look at this, but from a article almost like 10 years ago from a collaborator of ours, they looked at and said like, so how many drugs in the US are per year prescribed? How many prescriptions are filled? It's about four billion a year. And uh, when we look at current guidelines where pharmacogenetic or genetic tests are associated with these particular drugs, it's about 18%. That is out of four billion, it's a very significant number. And that, this means that pharmacogenetic testing is potentially indicated. And I don't wanna, Ask the audience, but you know, what do you think out of these 18% of these uh, prescriptions uh, filled, how many of these patients actually did receive pharmacogenetic testing? You don't need a study, I can tell you it's a very, very small, um, small percentage of, of that. And there are a number of reasons for this. And so our goal is really to overcome this. Uh, there are a number of different um, um, hurdles, uh, you know, which we need to overcome, and we really help our customers and clients overcoming this and in the, in the process of implementing pharmacogenetic testing. So how does this really work? Um, obviously we want to 
don't have a pointer. I can't really point you. On the, on the left side, you know, we want to reduce and we want to target and identify the best patient for a particular drug. And we, to implement that, uh, we work currently uh, with major healthcare organizations, but we also work with the pharmaceutical companies um, and, and key opinion leaders in the pharmacogenetic space because you really need to target the whole, whole process from drug development to really bringing this to the patient. And we are a clinical diagnostic lab, so we're working with healthcare organizations, working with phys physicians, educating them, um, and um, implementing the whole process from ordering a test to bringing the test back to the physician, explaining this, integrating this into medical record, and providing um, decision support around this. So um, this is really our uh, approach, really built on our experience in clinical testing and implementation. In addition to that, and I'll show you one example, we're also working on uh, improving the, the test development. So why do we want to do pharmacogenetics? So pharmacogenetics is really one of the foundations of um, precision medicine. It's been around for quite some time. And, but we still have these challenges to bring this to a patient. And I think we can, in the panel, discuss what are the challenges are to really bring precision medicine to a patient and helping physicians implement that. Um, pharmacogenetic testing can solve some of the major causes of adverse drug reactions. And um, there are a lot of studies out there which show the uh, beneficial effect, the cost savings, but most important for patients and physicians, also reduction of adverse uh, drug reactions. Um, so we, wanna have, we have a couple of, of tests. Our most comprehensive test basically tests all the pharmacogenes you ever really want to test. And one of the advantages is that obviously genetic information doesn't change. So if you have a test, had a test done maybe five or 10 years ago, the information is still relevant. And um, the only difference is that you know, if you go to your physician, you need a new prescription. If you had a very comprehensive test done, the turnaround time is really zero seconds because all the tests are there and you can immediately utilize these tests. We test about uh, over a thousand genes um, and this is the currently most comprehensive test currently um, on the market. Um, what this also allows us is really address the need of our customers and um, the number of disease areas uh, is a little bit hard to see. but. Um, it, it's not specific to oncology. So, you know, when we talk about precision medicine, a lot of time we only think about cancer. But there are a lot of other areas where precision medicine actually can play a key role as well. Cardiovascular disease is still also one of the main causes of, of death in, in this country. Um, hematology, oncology, neurology, heart and cardiovascular uh, are areas where pharmacogenetics and drugs are used, where pharmacogenetic information can be useful. Um, as well as pain management. So we really encapsulate a very broad spectrum of potential uh, customers who have very different needs and uh, levels of understanding and how they would like to implement that. And we tailor that to their needs. Um, we also tailor this um, in terms of what type of customer or patients they want to address. And you can look at this and say like, you know what, we really want to just target right now very high risk patients. Patients, for example, who have multiple prescriptions, who experience adverse uh, uh, side effects, um, and obviously one area we're looking at this, and you know, one of our target areas is pediatrics, and the other one where you see a lot of patients with uh, a lot of different drugs is in the geriatric space. And so you can really tailor this on your risk profile and expand it from very targeted uh, to bring this to much broader to healthcare organizations. And there are some hospitals and healthcare organizations who do a very broad-based testing, so the information is actually right uh, available. Um, we also, as I said, you know, we're developing uh, new tests, and I just want to highlight a recent publication. What we had, uh, there is one gene, and I'm not going to go too much into this, uh, CYP2D6. About 20% of all the drugs currently on the market are somehow linked to this particular gene. Every pharmacologist, every um, toxicologist, um, you know, knows about this uh, because most of, very many drugs get metabolized by that. Uh, it is, from an analysis point, a profusely challenging gene. Not going to go into this, why? But it is just really funky from a biology point of view. Um, and from a clinical testing point of view, it is very difficult to analyze. And um, so just uh, a few months ago, we um, presented a, a very comprehensive way to analyze this gene in one big swoop. Um, without a lot of like going back and forth, and um, this can be done in, in a matter of, uh, with a turnaround time of a day or two, a, a total new way to, 
to analyze this, uh, this genome we're offering this um, as a service. Um, and we're working on additional test development using these, um, this platform using uh, long-range uh, sequencing. So I want to really briefly mention all some of our, our customers and um, you know, strategic relationships. We're working really with key opinion leaders um, and contributing some, some of the major databases which curate um, genetic information, also develop uh, the guidelines and review of evidence-based implementation, in particular CPIC, um, our academic partners, and again, you know, want to thank also the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, as a spin out uh, from this company. And um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about precision medicine. It's been on, on the uh, forefront of what we've been doing. And, um, and um, I'm excited to discuss um, opportunities, what we have in the uh, pharmacogenetic space. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Many thanks, Uli. It's now my pleasure to introduce Chris Riley, the Vice President and Group Executive of Danaher. Good morning. This is where you respond back. Good morning. We need to inject a little bit of energy. We'll have the um, ushers bring in some coffee here in a bit. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank Lisa for the warm invitation to come and speak today. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dean John for moderating today's panel and the contributions from my fellow panelists, Uli and Leslie. Uh, Danaher may be a company name that you may not remember or know much about, but you may know many of, many of the member companies within our business. There are leaders in diagnostics, life sciences, as well as bioprocessing. We are united in a common vision. There are 65,000 associates within Danaher, and we are incredibly dedicated to the idea of advancing precision medicine, and I appreciate uh, Dean John's opening remarks around where the science is taking us and the excitement that we can generate as an industry, as an academic collaboration model across the United States and across the world. For the past 15 years, we have been accelerating our portfolio transformation to work on some of society's most pressing problems. And we are completely, very honored to be able to complement the work of sponsors and academic researchers. We also feel a deep sense of obligation about our opportunity to accelerate the development of these therapies as well as compress the cost of them. They're frankly too expensive and they don't reach enough patients fast enough and there are many people in need. Uh, it's probably useful to look a little bit back in history. In a space of just about 100 years, we've moved from mitigating symptoms to addressing the fundamental deficiencies within our genetic code. That is incredibly exciting in terms of our ability to correct. And we're making strategic bets around that the future of medicine will be around increasingly cell and gene therapies and using tools like CRISPR nucleases and mRNA vaccines as the standards of care, hopefully, in the future. Now, when you look at the slide, of course, the number of on-market therapies is actually quite small. We're still very much in the early days of this revolution. But the rich pipeline that comes behind this gives us great hope that the promise of genetic medicines is just, frankly, around the corner. But we need to recognize that the complexity of these therapies has grown exponentially. Aspirin is 21 atoms in a molecule. A CAR-T therapy is 10 to the 22 power number of atoms. It's 20 plus logs more complex. And frankly, we've been harnessing biological processes now in order to achieve the manufacturing scale up that we need. Obviously a big manufacturing challenge. But I was happy to hear Uli talk about some of the work that he's doing because the diagnostics challenge here is equally problematic. There are over 5,000 diseases that are labeled monogenic. Single, single gene uh, discrepancy causes that. They're labeled as rare diseases, yet one in 10 of us suffers from a genetic disorder. One in 10. So the idea of rare is frankly not so rare at all. And as we learn more about cancer, well frankly the tumor burden that we have uh, individually varies quite dramatically from patient to patient, even for those who have similar diagnoses. So cancer is uh, incredibly personal for more reasons than of course the impact on the families and their loved ones. So we have huge patient needs. Uh, we have tremendous complexity that we need to address to really drive this type of revolution. 
So we've been assembling a suite of companies now for the past 15 years to really accelerate what we're describing as sequence to vial. The idea that we can understand the genetic code necessary to drive the therapeutic, but also build the manufacturing processes and analytics to prove that it's safe and high quality. And Danner has over 40 years of working in industries where we help with quality and yield, traditional manufacturing processes, but we're increasingly adding capabilities um, that allow us to drive clinical effectiveness. And one of the reasons that uh, we invited the Aldevron company, which is based here in Madison, to join us in this journey. So we have a long track record of helping clients with this. I'd like to maybe showcase three examples and starting with diagnostics as one. Diagnostics, of course, remains a fundamental capability to identify the genetic variation. And the pharmacogenetic example that uh, Uli shared, of course, is a perfect example of this. And these genetic variants can be very difficult to identify, and it's really exacerbated in solid tumor, right? Because often the biopsy quantity is, is, um, is very small. Sometimes the biopsy quality is very poor, quite different than a hematological cancer. And so inside of solid tumor, in particular, you see a lot of gene fusions. You have two partners, they come together, they fuse in a, in a, um, a way that you would not anticipate that creates uh, apparent protein expression. Those proteins have very important uh, influence on the way the cellular pathways of cancer operate. So knowing how this, knowing the, being able to identify these cancer fusions is a big deal. Traditional NGS technologies, though, are challenged because you have to identify both partners in order to then Dot, you know, identify your way to the, uh, the actual fusion itself. So uh, we have a team at, uh, called Archer. They work on technologies that do specific enrichment technologies, amplification, amplification technologies. So you only need to know one partner in order to do this. So we're helping researchers uh, better identify fusion, uh, uh, gene fusions in order to then, of course, help with the therapeutic uh, selection. And what's interesting is kind of on the far right side of the, of the slide is you can see even at very small quantities and very small concentrations, we're still having high specificity in terms of the readout. So we're excited about where that technology is taking, is taking science. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the challenges around manufacturing. So let's dive into an example of this. And this is, uh, many of you have heard about CAR-T therapies. There are now six on the market. And um, CAR-T is where you harvest from the patient, the T cells, and then you genetically modify it by basically adding uh, an antigen receptor. Think of it as a guidance system to really latch on to the cancer um, of, of interest. And these are, um, these are very challenging um, uh, therapies to go manufacture, because think about what's happened here. The patient's now gone through second, third line levels of therapy. Their immune system has been incredibly weakened by these therapies. The patient's frankly exhausted. And the input to that manufacturing process is the patient's own cells, which have been weakened in this process. Now, the traditional means of, of now adding that guidance system has been through viral vector approaches. So those approaches have some limitations of further weakening the exhausting these T cells. So actually, Dr. Christian Capatini and Dr. Chris Saha, who are local professors at the Carbone Cancer Center, as well as the University of Wisconsin, they really worked to develop a new approach here that's virus vector free. And the figure on the left-hand side shows how we did this, which was working with that team. We used a specific um, CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease, the editor, coupled with guide RNA from one of our company's IDT, Think of it as the, the selection of the site with which to make the edit and created a virus vector-free product. And what was really exciting about this approach was the potency, it was demonstrated on the top right side. And this is tumor-bearing mice, I should mention, this is not in humans. But the research showed that the clearance capability of virus vector-free approaches was far superior and statistically very significant here. And what was more exciting about it was when you look at the bottom uh, graph, I, I will admit to not knowing everything about this graph for the record. Um, but in the, the figure in the bottom right left-hand side, if you actually do a, a flow cytometry to look at some of the phenotypic expression on the surface, you see fewer signs of uh, markers that, that indicate exhaustion of the cell. So we're able to use a technique here to dramatically improve the potency, but also not exhaust the T cell. And, uh, and this is, you know, huge implications for, for patient outcomes, and we're excited about where this research is going. And then lastly, I'd like to finish with an example um, 
also supported by our team here in Madison, which is around gene editing efficacy. And drug product delivery is a big deal in genomic medicines. Your liver is an awesome accumulator of a lot of, our, a lot of these therapies. It's the garbage disposal of the body. And so when you want to target something else, product, drug product delivery is a massive challenge. And specifically in, in CNS systems, uh, CNS disorders. Uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, who is the Nobel Prize winner for her seminal work around CRISPR editors. And this team, um, which they published here in August just recently, this idea of building a cell-penetrant peptide, basically a, an editor with a guide, in order to um, have better effects, and the hypothesis would have better effects than the gold standard of CNS treatments, or brain treatments, is around AAV therapies. So again, trying a non-viral vector-based approach. And the top right uh, figure was actually was, was the exciting piece of this because you saw better editing efficacy with the uh, ribonucleic protein built with the Cas9 enzyme on the left-hand side as compared to the right-hand side, which was the prior gold standard of this, and this is around the microglia of mice. Uh, I'm happy I can actually pronounce that on stage, microglia. Um, but then what was really exciting and was that uh, Dr. Dowden and her team from the Institute for Genomic Innovations came to us and said, look, we have to worry about toxicity. And, and nowhere is that more, more prevalent and relevant than in the brain. And the team at Eldevron, which has some wonderful process development techniques, uh, optimized the proteins in order to have very low levels of endotoxins, which are shown there in the figure on the right. So some exciting things in where we are, but also very early stages. We got to move from, from, from mice to, to people, obviously. Um, but we are proud uh, to be uh, a member of this community. Uh, we are a very global business. Um, we're, uh, but all three of the examples that I shared were, were supported by our genomic medicines colleagues here in the Midwest. Two of the three were supported by our team right here in Madison. And uh, two-thirds of our genomic medicines business is based right here in the Midwest. Uh, importantly, we do like to, to think of Madison as one of our homes. Um, we're, we all are, our Madison-based, uh, our proteins business is based here in Madison, has been launched about 13 years ago. Uh, they continue to be innovators in the field of process development and scale-up capabilities to help a lot of these technologies come to fruition. So in closing, I thought I would just talk about a few of our priorities as an organization. Uh, we are continuing to invest here in the Midwest, inclusive of here in Madison, around our expansions in cell and gene therapy. We're adding scientific talent for the students in the audience, uh, not only just in R&D, but also critical support functions, quality, regulatory, technical operations. Uh, we have uh, many needs there. Um, we, uh, as, as you saw, all three of those examples that I shared were in close collaboration with outrageously creative uh, collaborators, and so we're so thrilled to have the opportunity to do that. And we are continuing to invest in order to do our part here as well. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Many thanks, Chris. Inspirational work. Uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Leslie Lemke Butcher, who is the Vice President of Non-Clinical Toxicology at Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals. Thank you. As a member of the board of BioForward, I would like to really sincerely thank you all for coming here today and to Lisa and her team for putting together this fantastic event. I would also like to thank the gentleman here on the stage with me for giving such a great introduction to toxicology. Um, the, the comment about P450 2D6 is something that is beaten into us through our graduate education and I have not previously heard anybody else refer to the liver as the garbage disposal of the body, which is a very well-known reason why you will typically never see a toxicologist having liver and onions for dinner. That's uh, just my little plug there. So, um, well, my colleagues have given an introduction to the future of the science of pharmacogenomics. <clears throat> I'm going to switch gears a little bit and give you some examples of how it's actually being used today. So Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals is a company here located at the, our main site is at the University Research Park um, over off of Mineral Point and Rosa. We have been around in various iterations for over 30 years. We are very specific to one type of um, 
drug product, which is small inhibitory RNAs. And um, in where most people talk or hear frequently about cell or gene therapies, these are therapies that take a lot of manipulation of material that came out of the human body, as Chris was referring to. SIRNA tries to use some of that same genomic science to administer a drug to a patient, so much less invasive than trying to take out cells and manipulate the DNA and put them back in. We create a very specialized type of, they're considered small molecule drugs, but it's not small. I don't have a number quote to uh, tie to what Chris mentioned about gene therapies versus traditional drugs like aspirin, but we take advantage of all of this genomics information out there to look and say, okay, this patient population is manifesting these symptoms. Can we track back to what gene is causing it? And if the etiology of that disease is due to an overexpression of that particular protein, either in a mutant form so that it's accumulating and not working, or it's due to multiple copies of that gene propagating within the patient's or the family tree's DNA over time, we can turn those off. So it's a very specific niche for siRNA. As you can see on the graphic I have here, this technology utilizes a control system that's already in the cells. So the RNA uh, or um, risk complex is an, an enzyme complex within normal cells that the body uses to regulate mRNA expression and then therefore the translation into protein. By taking complementary sequences of RNA and modifying them for stability in the body, we can basically trick this system that's already functioning in the cells to degrade our targeted message before the protein is ever expressed. One of the advantages here is it's not permanent. So if a patient does have an adverse response to it, you don't have to worry like a gene therapy, how am I going to manage this? They also can be very long acting where most of us recognize if you have high blood pressure, you're taking that drug every day for the rest of your life. The goal here is to be able to get to the point where maybe you get one subcutaneous injection every three months or even longer and that takes care of that disease. I don't know how many clinicians are in the room, but patient compliance is always a major issue. If you have a serious disease and the patient just has to go into your office and get a shot once every three months, you have a much better chance that that patient's disease process is gonna be controlled. So um, at, our, at Arrowhead, we have a very particular set of algorithmic data and um, that helps us pick the exact characteristic of the DNA sequence that needs to be targeted in order to most effectively manage that expression profile. So that part is patented and I can see our lawyer in the office or in the auditorium. So, you know, got, made sure got that piece in. So um, Arrowhead's origins really are at that facility over in the research park here that I mentioned. We also have a large facility in San Diego, California. And at these facilities, anything that you could imagine you need to do to act as a pharmaceutical company are already happening. So those students in the audience who are interested in computers and big data, the bioinformatics of how do we scour all the knowledge in the world and figure out what new genetics is becoming available that should help us guide to another disease. We, ha we do that. We have a variety of chemistry um, capabilities for designing these new molecules, thinking about how we modify them to evade the normal control and degradation systems in the body, how we make sure we apply kind of a lock and key mechanism. So again, as Chris mentioned, a targeting moiety. So it's the guided missile to hopefully the exact and only type of cell that you're looking for. Um, all the biochemistry, the pharmacology, I'm head of toxicology. So the full spectrum of components that need to go into a pharmaceutical approval package we're currently doing here in Madison. This is a, a 
quick photo of our current facility. As I said, we have manufacturing process development, very chemistry and biochemistry focused. We can manufacture all of our materials for small phase clinical trials or first in human trials ourselves. And being able to do that capability in house, not having to schedule at a busy third party vendor and, and work around other people's needs, typically gets us into the clinic six to 12 months faster than we would if we were solely reliant on external organizations. And this, this building has over 100,000 square feet of laboratory space. This is my new favorite picture. If anybody lives out in the Verona or Fitchburg area, this is a computer rendering of what the facility that we just opened in October will look like when it's completely landscaped out. Um, this new building has over 140,000 square feet of lab and office space. We will also have a very large, on the left-hand side there, uh, manufacturing capability. This will allow us to continue to produce for even larger and larger scale uh, clinical trials in our own hands. So great opportunity for students. If you're looking for new opportunities, please visit our uh, table and our HR representatives out during the, the networking session and such. But these are things that are really happening. You know, most people, when you think of pharmaceutical companies, think of East Coast and West Coast. This is happening here in, in Wisconsin. And we see a great benefit to the fact that there's a huge draw for people who want a different lifestyle than the East Coast, West Coast. So there are opportunities regardless of what kind of backgrounds you're looking for. So the first place that SIRNA has been put into practice for these types of therapies has been the liver. Again, to toxicologist's favorite subject. We want to be able to find a way to get your gene of interest modulated in a specific target tissue. The liver is a great example for this because there are, it, are a number of different receptor types that are primarily only expressed on the hepatocyte or the major workhorse cell of the liver. So the trim platform and our GALNAC is the conjugate that we attach to it, our very high fidelity of getting specific to, specifically to the liver to have the physiologic effect that we're looking for. The first time anybody talked about siRNA, as you can imagine, all the global regulatory agencies were quite concerned about this new entity and what is it, what kind of wild card issues is it gonna have? Um, we even are on platform version two because you have to learn as you do these things. But with the current technologies that are out there across the industry, there's a very high safety profile. I mentioned here that there's minimal class effects, a little bit like if you get an infection, because as you can imagine, anytime something unknown and different is going into the body, it's very normal for your immune system to at least check in, touch it, decide is this okay or is this not okay. But those are all things that are very minimal, um, no kind of quality of life impact on the patients, and they typically, any kind of symptomology resolves within about 48 hours. So I have a couple, uh, in this presentation, a couple news releases from our archives. The first one being um, our AAT program that is partnered with Takeda, getting its, um, let's see which one, breakthrough therapy designation, sorry. Um, we also, prior to achieving this breakthrough therapy, had also received orphan drug designation and fast track designation. And these are very critical elements of getting you essentially a fast pass with regulatory agencies so that you have more opportunities to talk to them about the science of your drug, how to formulate the plan for your clinical trials, how to prioritize patient enrollment, so this is something that is very functional, actionable is the, for the science. This particular product is aimed for um, a liver disease that also has some respiratory manifestations, but it's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So deficiency, but the reality is the patients are making a form of this protein that is not functional. Normally it's expressed and it's protective in the lungs, but if it makes a dysfunctional form and it continues to accumulate. It's kind of like 
every now and then the, the pipes at your house need to be cleaned out. This is sort of that type of phenomena where you get too much of it and it starts to have problems. So again, in keeping with what this presentation series is about, these are patients who, when we enroll them in the clinical trial, one of the first questions we have to ask is, what does their genetic code look like? Do they have the type of mutation that fits mechanistically with the type of therapy that we're doing? So they're all screened for their PIZZ genotype, which is specific for this disease, and then looking at the level of fibrosis or damage they already have to their liver with a variety of imaging techniques. We do exclude patients who have very severe liver disease because again, the goal is to be able to see changes and if you're in an end stage disease, the likelihood of seeing any benefit is pretty small. Um, so few demographics you would expect that we exclude. This is some of the example of efficacy data from this program where again, this particular graph is looking at, um, I can't even read that. Where did that go? Serum changes in the AAT protein. So this is considered a traditional biomarker. You can take blood from the patients. You can do a biochemistry assay on a number of other diseases or targets and actually look for activity of this protein. Or you can do something like a Western bot and see, is this patient producing as much of this abnormal protein as they did before we started treatment? But the key here is patients who have not received any treatment or the sham, they stay pretty close to that baseline all the way through the study. Dose responsive knockdown of the expression of this protein up to 93.5% removal or 94% removal after just two doses. And then as you see here, the rest of those intervals are four months between doses that we maintain that knockdown and functionality of this um, therapeutic and are able to monitor that with the, the biomarker. So this product, again, is this is from early data, but it's continuing in development. Another example for uh, inherited and lifestyle-driven disease is our Aero APOC3 program. This also has fast-track designation in the U.S. and orphan designation by the U.S. and Europe. Same type of modality being the RNAi. Alpha protein, alpha protein C is a small um, apoprotein that mainly resides in <coughs> triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So most of us don't talk about that. We know we go to the doctor and they tell us our HDL is good, our LDL is good, our LDL um, extra high, et cetera, are okay or not. This is something where there are specific patient populations that can have a inherited genetic disease, so they have familial um, cholesterol anemia syndrome. And by treating it, we're actually able to bring them back to a normal quality of life. Some of these patients have severe pancreatitis attacks, so their quality of life, their ability to go to a restaurant and eat like everybody else and not get sick is, is not quite there. So we're, we want to be able to help them. Again, they have to come into the trial with a medical history of very high levels. They have to be a carrier for one of the rare mutations. We do know from looking at um, epidemiological data that completely knocking out this gene is not expected to cause any harm because there are families at the opposite extreme that don't express it at all, that are perfectly healthy, able to have children and, and continue cycles. So we look at each one of those types of attributes before we pick a target to go forward. And then this is data from the um, clinical trial that we ran. This is a, a molecule that is wholly owned by Arrowhead. Again, we're looking at the serum concentration of the biomarker as well as looking at the triglyceride, triglycerides themselves. And similar to the other program, with very small amount of drug on board and here very infrequently, only once every three months, we're able to see over 85% knockdown in circulating triglycerides in these patients, which if you're a patient population that has levels that are you know, off the chart, 1,500, et cetera, 
having this type of a magnitude of change is truly impactful for your quality of life. And then the last slide I have here is just an example of our pipeline to show you that while the original drugs that are currently on the market for siRNA are primarily around the liver, the lessons that we're learning and expanding upon are allowing us to go into more and more therapeutic areas so that we can reach more of those rare disease targets that for whatever reason, their mechanism of, of disease manifestation is not conducive to a traditional small molecule therapy. So, um, you know, again, lots going on. There are many facets of our industry that are happening here in Wisconsin, and we're looking forward to hearing any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Inspirational work. I'm gonna take advantage of having the mic for one minute to reflect on a very personal story. So in July of this year, as we get set up up here, I was sitting in the backyard uh, with a friend of mine who no longer could make it up the stairs. I convinced her to go into the emergency room. She got checked in. She got evaluated, diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Her biopsy was sent off for sequencing. Typical turnaround time right now for the vast population is four to six weeks to do a full NGS panel. We need to do better. And here in Wisconsin, I believe we truly can. And one of the pathways to doing better is through enhanced collaboration. We heard this, I think, over and over in all of the talks this morning. Enhanced collaboration between the academic enterprise and the industry enterprise is, I think, a path forward where we can really excel beyond uh, anyone's wildest dreams. With that, I want to open up to questions that we may have in the, in the audience. I believe there are mics that are set up in the aisles. Feel free to please approach the mic. Thank you, brave soul. Yeah, bit of a fake out there, sorry. Um, uh, so I, I, we, we've, we've heard the term uh, personalized medicine, we've heard the term precision medicine or precision technologies. Just to kind of set the, the, the playing field here, uh, how, how does everyone define personalized medicine versus precision medicine? Is, is there a difference in your mind and uh, how, how do those two uh, interrelate? So maybe I'll kick it off with the professor answer. <laughs> I think historically, personalized medicine was incredibly difficult to achieve. This is ultimately medicine that's to the individual at the right time uh, in the right scenario. That's incredibly hard to achieve. I, I don't honestly believe we're quite there yet. You have to integrate all of these different approaches ultimately to uh, be able to make a therapeutic that is going to be very, very specific to an individual, one person. Precision medicine, I think, is targeted more towards a population that have very similar disease profiles that can be addressed through a therapeutic approach, but it's not down to the individual person. But I believe we're transitioning now to the point at which personalized medicine is actually going to become a reality. That's my interpretation. I'm right. happy to hear others. No, I think it's well said. There's, um, there are two phase two trials ongoing right now around personalized cancer vaccines, personalized. So they're mRNA coupled with a PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, one study was done by Merck Moderna, the other one was done by Roche and presumably BioNTech, I'm, I, I forget, forgive me. But both of those showed a 44, 45% reduction in, in uh, reoccurrence, which is dramatic, dramatic in cancer. So I think, it, it kind of points to where the world is evolving. Our ability to manufacture at that level of N of one precision is an unsolved problem right now. So, you know, we're still working on how do you solve for N of 300,000, which would still be considered low incident rates, you know, in a global population. So, uh, but I think we, the, the steps forward are becoming increasingly clearer. It's a great question. I'm glad you took the opening. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
let, let me add to this. So uh, the only one point from a, from a clinical point of view is that, I mean, if we look at ourselves as, as patients, I, I think everybody, if you go to a physician, you would like to be treated as like a person and, and have your personalized treatment. So in, in some ways, then, you know, this is not really new because, you know, you don't want to be just a number showing up at 10 and being at 10, 15 out the door. Um, so, so I think personalized medicine is really the goal we, we want to aspire to, and that's not only genetic testing and so on. I mean, that includes a lot of different things, really tailoring your treatment, your prevention, any, anything about healthcare around a particular uh, patient. And um, there are, again, many examples um, right now where you know, the treatment is specifically developed for the patient, where uh, in, in, in a cancer space, um, they're, they're you know, specific to a person's cancer, the diagnostic tool gets developed and the treatment gets developed. I mean, those are really rare examples right now. Again, you know, as we said, you know, I think it, it's developing in this direction. Um, the question is, does it become cost effective? And do we really need to go that personal in any case? And I think that's really gonna be the, uh, one of the challenges what we see in, in, in personalized care right now, how personalized does it need to be? Uh, is it becoming too cost prohibitive or are the technologies which really allow us to do that um, and, um, and you know, what are the benefits? So um, that, that I think is the, the, the point which we try to calibrate right now. Also, my point. So um, I think it's interesting. We've, they're fantastic examples talking about personalized medicine and it's an interesting situation for me, because again, as a toxicologist, you know, we've been a little bit more focused on genetic basis of something. Um, in our case, it's adverse effects with drugs for a very long time. The first time the concept of pharmacogenomics was discussed was in the 50s. Um, as we met, I mentioned before, the P452D6 is something that we are very much engendered into remembering the importance of as we're going through school. What I would love to see about this new focus on precision medicine is a heightened awareness and understanding that we're not all just the textbook, right? I mean, it wasn't until the 90s that there were regulations that specifically required drug companies to think about the safety differences between women and men. and. It wasn't until the early 2000s that there were regulations specifically around protecting children. So we think about these things as being universal truths, but unless you're in the niche, you don't necessarily really think about and apply these things. That's why we do have so many challenges and you hear anecdotally in the news about you know, a particular ethnicity feeling like they're being mismanaged in a hospital or a care setting because you know, they have a reaction and nobody thinks about it. Part of my desire is to get to the point that the next generation starts to ask. And hopefully the tools will get there with the efforts that my colleagues here have talked about. But if we could just get to the point that in our healthcare system, we didn't try to think of everybody as that cookie cutter box and realize, you know, we need to think about the fact that you know, certain populations are going to be more susceptible to a certain type of toxicity in, as alongside of thinking about their genetics as a way to select them for a particular treatment. So the, it's very much a two-sided coin to me. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentations. I'm currently teaching faculty in the School of Pharmacy for our professional master's programs. And I have a lot of flexibility and freedom in what I teach our students. So I'd like to hear from all of you what I should be teaching my students to prepare them for this workforce. So I have like a soapbox for that one, so thank you. <laughs> um, Leslie, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think one of the things that I've seen changing across the course of my career, and I have debates even with my own children who are in their 20s about is, you know, kind of critical thinking and work ethic and, you know, so many sounds cliche. Um, I came from 
a very regulated area of intention in graduate school when you're being trained to be a toxicologist. They, they tell you you're going to have to think about data integrity and you know, traceability of your results just like in clinical trials. If it's not written down, you didn't do it. And beyond that, if you do something, you're running a biochemical assay or a DNA screen and something odd happens, like put your Sherlock Holmes hat on and really think about, does, is that a new discovery or is that just the settings on my mass spec are wrong and that's why all of a sudden you know, this peak is showing up that has never been seen before, et cetera. So really thinking about critical thinking skills and ownership of the data and the quality, the data integrity, anything that gets done that goes into a regulatory filing is subject to audit and review. Um, there was a, a case very recently that popped up in some of the scientific journals about various professors from different loca locations having to redact their work, having to leave their positions, or pharmaceutical companies getting their studies audited and not being able to present documentation to substantiate their work. Making sure that students understand that lab notebook and the quality of what you're doing and the critical thinking that you're applying to it are just absolutely critical because if you get audited and the quality of your work is found lacking, you can end up on what's referred to as the FDA debarment list. So they, they basically tell you, take your toys and go home, you can't play here anymore. So you know, if you wanna have a career in this industry, you have to know how important all those details are and to, to challenge yourself to think through everything. Can, I said can, I had a soap can I, a, So you're, you're teaching pharm future pharmacists, did I? No, I'm oh. actually teaching in the applied drug development. Oh, stuff. applied drug development. Okay, so so let, I'll, I'll make it really short. So uh, most of the successful pharmacogenetic <laughs> programs are actually led by pharmacists. So if you were teaching them pharmacists or if them pharmacists here, um, pharmacogenetics is is the area where you can really expand. And so we're working with uh, our school of pharmacy at, at MCW. Every uh, pharmacy student in, in the first year. Uh, gets uh, pharmac very comprehensive pharmacogenetic testing done. They have their own pharmacogenetic results and they can learn on their own results how to in interpret that. And um, I think that's a, that's a really hands-on on experience. So if, if anybody is becoming a pharmacist, I think that's certainly an area where you, um, where you can shine. We actually do teach a uh, 2D6 phenotyping lab in one of my All right, courses. excellent. So, let me know if you have questions. <laughs> I'll pick your brain afterwards. I'll add a little philosophical comment here for your students. Um, I think there's this undercurrent in society right now that following uh, rigid instructions, having discipline about a, a lab workbook, to, to use your example, um, following work instructions in an SOP is somehow counter to being creative. And I think we need to work hard to abolish that view because in that discipline, you find the deviations that Leslie was talking about that leads to the next level of discovery. And so this combination of being rigorous and disciplined in pursuit of, of excellence and perfection yields uh, the opportunity to be, to be curious, to be creative on terms of what comes next. And so I, I, I worry a little bit around um, the kind of the tone within broader society around that and helping students understand the value of, of being disciplined and rigorous. And I'll piggyback just a bit off of that and say break down silos, teach them not to build those up. The pharmacologist should be talking to the pharmacist, should be talking to the biochemist, should be talking to the neuroscientist. The more we have collaboration and integration of approaches, the better off we'll all be. The other point that I would make is consider health equity. When we talk about a lot of these personalized approaches to care, especially when we're talking about to the individual, that can be incredibly costly. So how are we going to actually be able to deliver rigorous personalized medicine to a broad community across our entire state of Wisconsin, just as an example? Uh, and that piece of health equity, I think, has to be a top of mind as we're training the next generation of scientists. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, uh, John Reimer with Zyogenics. This question is for Chris. 
with all the great things that Danaher and Eldevron are doing within cell therapy and the advances we are making, other than approvals and the cost, what do you think the biggest challenge the industry is facing? Uh, your question is specific to cell therapy? Cell and gene. Yeah. Cell, cell and gene. Yeah. Um, well, boy, many ways, many vectors to take that question because uh, obviously your, your point was well made, right? Which is uh, we have a, a number of therapies that are awaiting approvals within the FDA right now, so we have a regulatory log jam. We have an organization in the FDA that's uh, has signaled a new willingness to think around platforming approaches because of the recognition that to solve for whether it's uh, truly personalized medicine uh, or, or some, some other subset, that the cost of those clinical trials is going to be prohibitive. And frankly, the number uh, for, for some levels of, of genetic variation we're talking about trying to find a you know, try to do a double arm study is almost impossible, right? Because the number of people. So I think regulatory, we have a, a big challenge to go solve. Um, I think frankly, uh, we have a talent problem in the industry broadly. We need more students who, who aspire to, to join us. And, and, and I don't mean, I mean that as an industry, by the way, I should say it that way. Um, I think that's also a, a big challenge. And we've not solved for, um, I think, you know, Dean John said it well, right? Health, health equities here are going to be a big challenge. Some of these therapies are coming out at two to three million dollars, you know, a treatment uh, that is going to uh, be an incredible imposition on families, on governments, on payer systems, and that's that ultimately can't be the the solution of the future. We have to work on compression of time because time is money. These businesses are burning you know millions of dollars a month per cash. So if we can compress the time, hopefully we can find a path to therapies that are more broadly accessible. So. Uh, I mean, we could go on from there, but we'll, maybe I'll just summarize it with that. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Hi. Uh, thanks for the interesting uh, talks. Jonathan Davis from Invenra. We're a, a URP neighbor. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the interface between AI and reality here. So uh, the, the sort of things that you're talking about with personalized or precision me medicine uh, could be greatly enhanced and sped up if we had an, used artificial intelligence to figure out the connections between taking some drug and having some uh, set of biomarkers and having some genomic features and, and uh, having taken some uh, over-the-counter you know, herbal remedy or who knows what would be all combined. But you can't do a phase three clinical trial to test each one of these things. If we had the data, if we could say, like, everyone in Wisconsin, we're going to track every time, any, any genetic testing you do, that'll go in the database. We'll, anytime you get your blood work done, that'll go in the database. You give us all the drugs you're taking, all the, you know, what your diet is, your exercise, your, uh, <clears throat> you know, any other things you take, vitamins, whatever it may be. AI could do amazing things if it had that kind of data. But HIPAA kind of says you can't do that. So is there any way to get that kind of data to really help AI be able to solve some of these incredibly complex uh, problems and find the relationships? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think there's actually a lot of people who are trying to solve this. This is not, um, is a fertile ground. I, I, by the way, I, I agree with your, your premise. Uh, there are a number of um, institutions, health, cent health systems, states, state of Indiana shares data uh, on their system, Tricor in Arizona, which has a, a large population that's generally doesn't move out of state. Uh, a lot of Native Americans in that in that state. Um, uh, the uh, Nation uh, National Health Service of the UK, NHS, is working on how do you share across large populations. And good news is, once you have a million people, you have a pretty good data set, right? Uh, you don't need you don't need to have 30 million. Um, and I think the the things that we're going to learn as part of those early stage will create the momentum to go continue to invest and do more. And where you're seeing, I think, um, I believe uh, Uli said this earlier around precision versus personalized, I think we'll see uh, better diagnostics performance out of that. And frankly, before we even worry about personalized diagnostics, we just got to get to be correct diagnostics. And there's so much that done in the cancer world, which is frankly wrong. So if you could use AI as a 
as a um, safety check against a pathologist's work, you know, that, that would be an interesting, you know, case study as, as but one small step of the broader picture that you just, you just envisioned. And we're going to see the applications of AI and ML around synthetic biology to get to higher and higher levels of clinical effectiveness on some of the uh, programs we're, we're working on, which will also drive better yields. So we're looking at it from a yield and efficacy, which, you know, should boost, boost the performance of the therapy at much lower cost. So the world, this is like a super exciting space. I just think we're so new to it right now. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. I know. Oh. Sorry. I was just going to say I, I agree with everything Chris said, and I appreciate your focus on the data to feed in. I fear that pop culture today thinks that, you know, we can just write a computer program to simulate everything and we'll replace having to ever do a clinical trial. Um, so I think part of our responsibility is to educate people in the, the common um, world of media, et cetera, about the fact that we do need data first before we can get to some of that future state. So I'm, I'm optimistic we will eventually get there. I know along with the sources Chris was talking about, many pharmaceutical companies that, especially if they are doing any kind of genetic testing, do include in their informed consent a request to be able to use that data to, to manage the HIPAA constraint. There's also a number of testing labs, and I, I'm not going to speak for them, but I know LabCorp was asking people, if you are a genetic, rare genetic disease, are you willing to allow some of your data to go into a database for these tracking purposes? So just getting the general public to not be afraid of the technology and to be open to those uses to help, you know, we need obviously the right control measures in place so everything is masked and nobody's worried about, is my insurance company gonna exclude me because I tested as a ultra rapid 2D6 metabolizer and you know, that puts me at risk in certain places. We have to get away from that mindset before we'll ever even begin to really delve into the, the real utility of AI. I have seen some other applications discussed more recently where it's kind of coming at it from the other side and really taking the data that we do know about the biochemistry or physiology of certain targets and creating 3D models of the protein or the linker that we're trying to interact with to create new targeting systems or new ways of engaging. So they're kind of reverse engineering what their drug looks like based on all the physiochemical characteristics of the target. So there's applications for it. We just have to continue to be dynamic and creative and understanding. We may not have that perfect world yet, but what are the pieces that we can use to help accelerate? Because again, in the industry, we all know the patients are waiting. We want to figure out how to get them that ideal therapy as quickly as possible. I want to be respectful for everyone's time. We're at 10.30, so I think we're going to go into our break. I'm very sorry to not take your question, but let's all meet the five of us uh, <laughs> after this. Uh, Lisa said she would you know, take away my kids if I didn't keep them on time. So. <laughs> all right, come on. Let's give a round of applause.